Hello, I'm Carmen Colosi, a Strat for Latin America analyst at Rain. This podcast is brought to you by Rain Worldview, the premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Learn more at worldview.stratfor.com. You are listening to Rain's Essential Geopolitics podcast from Stratfor. Welcome. I'm Emily Donahue. Libya is planning to hold its first ever presidential elections and the first major nationwide election since 2014. It's a bid to unify and bring stability to the country, but Stratfor senior global analyst at Rain, Matthew Bay, says that appears likely to be a tall order. Welcome to the podcast, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Emily. So let's jump in. What can you tell me about this? Can you briefly summarize some of the events leading up to these elections? Yeah. So really, Libya has been split into um, competing bases of power since the 2014 parliamentary elections. Um, Sometimes we had as many as three different people claiming to be prime minister. Um, So what the elections are designed to do is essentially try to unify the country and bring more stability. Um, And elections are planned for Um, December 24th. Um, Some of the things that have happened over the last uh, seven years that are that have kind of, you know, gotten to this moment of, you know, I guess, having elections itself as as some kind of progress towards stability um, was is that, you know, there was a major civil war where the East and the West were largely fighting each other. Um, Khalifa Haftar, the head of the uh, Libyan National Army, um, who which controls largely the entire eastern part of the country right now, um, did launch an invasion in 2019 to uh, take control of, of Tripoli. He failed, um, but that did lead to a moment where um, his failure enabled the UN to get together and have um, essentially negotiations for um, these elections. And they did select a unity government that was put into place um, earlier this year that was a caretaker to organize um, the elections that we were seeing, that we could be seeing in a couple of weeks. Now, uh, with that in mind, the entire election um, planning process hasn't really gone entirely to script. Um, for example, a lot of people were wanting to pass a uh, constitutional referendum law prior to the election and then hold a constitutional referendum to underpin the election prior to the election. That never happened. Um, and then also they were supposed to pass election laws for the, that underpin the parliamentary election and one that uh, underpins the presidential election while the um, House of Representatives, so that's the parliament based in, in, in Eastern Libya, did pass those election laws. The, the way that they did it was disputed. What was actually included was disputed. So um, there's actually not an alignment on those laws either. So there's a lot of challenges just when you look at, you know, how we even got here that a lot of people are wondering if we're not accelerating the elections too much and what does that actually mean if we are. Talk to me about who some of the top candidates might be. Yeah, so there are probably three main candidates that are, um, that, that are worth at least mentioning. Um, there was a recent poll that had these three at the top. Um, the, the, the highest kind of poll person that was getting the most votes in this poll was um, the current prime minister, um, Abdul Hamid uh, Dabaiba. Um, the second one uh, in that was Saif al-Islam uh, Gaddafi. So that is one of Gaddafi's sons. He's been basically in hiding for most of the last um, decade before coming out publicly to announce his, uh, he was running for president. Um, and then the the person I mentioned earlier, Khalifa Haftar, the Eastern uh, LNA commander, he has also put his hat in the ring. Um, of those three, they're the the main ones that gained um, more than five percent in that that poll that was conducted um, by a Libyan research firm earlier this month. Um, all the other candidates basically were getting z- um, zero to two percent, but of the three, Dabaiba, um, the current PM, was the one that got the most votes and was also. Um, in any kind of a runoff scenario, so this is going to be a runoff election if they if nobody gets more than fifty percent, um, which would be held in January. Um, he basically was also uh, having a pretty sizable lead in all those runoffs. Again, it's really hard to you know trust the accuracy in in um, polling data in a country like Libya where you know there's you know uh, political difficulties and things like that. Um, but it is the only kind of indication that we have that maybe Dabaiba is the the front runner right now. As I understand it, Matthew, all three have baggage associated with their candidacy. Can you describe some of the issues with these candidates? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So the the leader, Dabaiba, for example, 
um, he is essentially ruling the country only around um, the parts of, of Tripoli in the in the west. He doesn't have a lot of legitimacy in, in the eastern part of the country. Um, and to be clear, as the care, head of the caretaker government, he originally promised not to run in these elections, and then he uh, turned back against that. And some people actually filed court saying it was inconsistent with uh, inconsistent with a Sharia law. The, those court cases, at least as of right now, have uh, not resulted in him being removed from the election lists. So he's got major red flags when it comes to some of his his um, acceptedness outside of, of Tripoli itself. Um, Saif al Islam Gaddafi, he has the a UN investigation um, that's overhanging him. Not to mention that he's been, you know, sub, uh, sentenced to various different kinds of sentences by various Libyan courts because of his role under his father. Um, so he's obviously got a very a lot of baggage, and a lot of the still, you know, people that are looking at the revolution that was in 2011 as being a good thing, it's really hard for them to accept somebody that is really well, the son of the of the former uh, leader. Um, and then Haftar, Haftar, of course, invaded um, Tripoli. He's actually been, you know, uh, accused of various war crimes and even sentenced in some uh, places of Libya to war crimes um, in, in places like Misrata. So he's got a lot of, you know, baggage, especially in eastern Li or in western Libya, excuse me, um, where he has, you know, two years ago was launching a basically a military assault in the capital and, and, li and, and failed. So really, none of these candidates are really somebody that you can view as being unifying for the country. And... In that case, talk to me about any risks that might be associated with this effort to not only hold elections, but unify the country. Right. So I think, you know, because we are talking about an election, there's probably some a couple of scenarios that we can think about. Um, one of them being, you know, what happens if, for example, um, Prime Minister Dubaiba wins? Um, if he wins, um, it is not likely that Khalifa Haftar, so who controls the Libyan National Army, which is basically the entire bulk of you know military power in the eastern half of the country he's not likely to subject himself to actually accepting the leadership of Dubaiba. so what would happen is you would probably see essentially a continuation of the status quo where we would have essentially two bases of power in eastern libya and the western libya um, now if haftar wins we can think about that in the other direction it's very unlikely that a lot of the militias that were fighting against haftar um, just a few years ago, would accept him as a legitimate president. So he's not likely to be able to actually sit in Tripoli, the capital of the country. Um, so again, we could very well have, you know, a still divided country. And to be clear, if Haftar does win, well, he's going to have a lot of support in eastern Libya. Eastern Libya is only about, um, is only about 44% of the population of, of western Libya. Um, so that means that, you know, he's going to probably, you know, use, you know, voting irregularities to stuff the ballot boxes to try to get, you know, a lot of support and intim voter intimidation, things like that. So even if he wins, you know, the legitimacy of the outcomes can also be rejected, particularly as, you know, those election law irregularities that um, that not everybody is agreeing with. Um, you know, they can use that as an example to really say, I don't agree with Haftar winning because I think that it was done in a very suspicious and spurious fashion. Um, and then, of course, if Gaddafi wins, you then have the you know, what happened to the overall transition over the last decade? Will the international community accept him, um, given the, the ICC weight over his head and things like that? Um, not to mention, um, it's very unlikely that Haftar would, you know, submit to Gaddafi. Um, Haftar had a lot of personal issues with Gaddafi's father. Um, and then, uh, of course, in Western Libya, a lot of the revolutionaries also would not accept, you know, a return to a Gaddafi-type government. Um, so there really is a lot of risk here that we're talking about in terms of what happens, especially as none of those candidates are really, as I mentioned earlier, unifying figures. Now, one thing I think that's worth bearing in mind is we talked, you know, at the start that this is the first election that we've had since 2014. We have to realize that the 2014 election, that is a precedent that has been set and an example that we can point to of where a Libyan election actually led to more fragility, a, a bigger fracture, because what happened in 2014 um, was that a, a, an election with very low voter turnout, which is very possible this time around, um, led to a, the ousting of a, of a government that was um, a, a coalition that was between the Islamists um, and the Mizratans um, into a eastern dominated, eastern tribal dominated government. What happened was the eastern government couldn't really sit in Tripoli. They moved to um, the west or the eastern part of the country. And then the previous parliament set up shop as a, as a successor shop government. And that's how we had two governments and, and two different competing uh, prime ministers. So, so we do have very really clear examples where, you know, accelerating the election process to try to just have elections for the sake of having elections. And you can make the argument that a lot of the international community has been really been pushing elections because they view them as a success. The UN-led talks 
it could really go haywire, and that's a lot of a risk that I think a lot of people should be aware about right now. Matthew Bay is Stratfor Senior Global Analyst at Rain. The events in the Middle East and North Africa are geopolitically important. You can stay ahead of developments with Rain Worldview, powered by Stratfor. Visit stratfor.com to subscribe. Now through the end of 2021, we're offering special rates for you or someone on your gift list. Visit stratfor.com for details. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening. Thank you.